new talk I gave on Monday, but I guess the, there are some new faces here, so it will be fine. Uh, the idea is to present some different topics of my research in this talk, but before I start presenting my research, I will introduce myself a bit, little bit more. So I'm a PhD student uh, at, uh, of Applied Mathematics at Faculty of Technical Sciences, University of Novi Sad. My advisors are Silvia Gilezan and Zora Ognjanovic. And as you're going to see, um, I'm interested in lambda calculus, combinatory logic, type theory, probability logic, and more recently, I got interested in uh, data privacy, and in particular, in data privacy in blockchain. Uh, in uh, 2018, I participated in Erasmus Plus Mobility Program, which gave me opportunity to spend three months at uh, uh, University of Paris Diderot and to work with Michele Pagani. So one part of the talk will be also about the work I did back then. And I also participated in some national, international conferences and in some summer schools and exactly in one winter school where I also met some of you there. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is the, uh, the outline. Most of the talk will be actually about the things that were in the title, that is about probabilistic lambda calculus and probabilistic reasoning about type terms. But then I will also spend some time to say something about work in the field of resource control and about data privacy in blockchain, but very, very briefly. So the first part is actually the result of my visit to Paris, where I worked with, with uh, Michele Pagani, and we worked on probabilistic lambda calculus, that is uh, lambda calculus, which is extended with this probability operator. And uh, one challenging uh, problem there is proving program equivalence, that is proving that two programs will behave the same whenever we put them in any context. When we started our uh, collaboration, we had these few papers in front of us. The one paper considered call by name evaluation strategy and the other one considered call by value evaluation strategy. And the authors um, were looking for uh, a different uh, techniques to prove program equivalence. So they, are, they try to connect uh, context equivalence with uh, bisimilarity. Bisimilarity is able, we are able to introduce bisimilarity in probabilistic lambda calculus because we can see that lambda calculus as labeled, mar labeled Markov chain. So in the first paper where a uh, call by name evaluation strategy was adopted, the authors proved that uh, bisimilarity implies context equivalence, but that uh, the opposite does not hold. There are uh, terms that are context equivalent, but they are not bisimilar. In the other paper, where called by value uh, 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 evaluation strategy was considered, they proved that these two uh, equivalences actually coincide. Our question was, um, what is the gap? What uh, can be added to call by name evaluation uh, lambda calculus in order to, um, to achieve full abstraction, that is to have this equivalence be, uh, to have that context equivalence and the similarity coincide. And the answer was that uh, we can add Latin operator, which are in some sense, which simulate call by value strategy in call by name setting. So we consider this calculus where we have, so uh, in, as usual, variables, uh, abstraction application, we have this probability operator that was also in the previous calculus, but now we have this Latin operator. The operational semantics considered uh, as usual, so in, we are in probabilistic lambda calculus, so a term does not evaluate to one value, but to distribution of possible outcomes. So uh, when we speak about context equivalence, we say that two terms are context equivalent if uh, the probability of convergence is the same for any context. It uh, so, as I said, the idea is to find some uh, characterization of context equivalence, which would be easier to prove than uh, proving that the term, than checking all context and proving that uh, two terms have the same uh, probability on, of convergence. So, 
uh, I already mentioned that probabilistic lambda calculus can be seen as labeled Markov chain. And uh, for that reason, we are able to introduce uh, the notion of dissimilarity in probabilistic lambda calculus. That is what we did. We followed the approach that was uh, used also in those two papers I presented a few slides ago. And it was uh, really straightforward to prove that bisimilarity implies context equivalence. So whenever we have the two terms are bisimilar, we also know that they are context equivalent. But what we wanted to achieve is to have the other direction as well. So we wanted to prove that whenever two, uh, two terms are context equivalent, they are also bisimilar. In order to do that, we can follow the approach used in uh, the paper by Kolbe value, where they also use the paper that adopt Kolbe value evaluation strategy, because they also have decided the other direction. And uh, we introduced a testing language. And um, so uh, there, is a set, there, is, uh, there are tests that we can apply on a term. And whenever we apply tests on a term, then we have a probab probability of success of that test. What is important is that uh, the equivalence indu induced by this testing language uh, it actually coincides with bisimilarity. When we say uh, testing equivalence, I mean that two terms will be equivalent in this sense if the probability of success is uh, the same uh, for all tests for both terms. And so uh, at this point, what we have, we have that bisimilarity implies context equivalence. We have the testing equivalence uh, coincide with bisimilarity. What is missing? Well, we miss this arrow here. So now the idea is to prove that context equivalence implies testing equivalence. And uh, how is this done? Well, first we proved that for every test, there is an equivalent context. So whenever I have a test, I cannot find a context such that success probability of a test uh, applied to that term is the same as probability of convergence when a term is put in a context. And once, I, uh, once we proved that property, as a consequence, we obtained that context equivalence implies testing equivalence. So you see the circle is closed. Now we have that uh, these three uh, notions of equivalence, context equivalence, bisimilarity, and testing equivalence coincide. And uh, as I said, uh, these are the results of uh, that work I did in Paris, and uh, we had a paper, conference paper, about this <coughs> at uh, FSCD in 2019. So that is the first part. That is one of the topics um, I, uh, I worked on. And now uh, the second part is actually uh, the research I also presented on uh, Monday. But uh, here, as I said, the, my idea was to present different topics. So I, I don't go into any technical details. And I just want to give general idea of what I'm doing. I said, uh, so the topic is the same, but maybe the talk will uh, look a little bit different. I will start from a different point of work. I will start actually from the, be the beginning, and I uh, will say how we came to the idea to work on this. So uh, we were familiar with probability logics. And later, there will be a reference to a book where there is an overview of different probability logic. But we were looking at the logic called LPP2, which is the simplest one of uh, those. And what is uh, LPP2 logic? It is a probability logic where we can express the statement that probability that alpha is true is greater than or equal to s. How this logic is defined? First, the authors uh, start with classical propositional logic. So we have uh, classical proposition, uh, propositional letters and classical propositional connectives. Then on, uh, they, def uh, they apply these probability operators on classical propositional formulas. They obtain a set of probabilistic formulas, and they close that set under classical propositional connectives. So um, below this, uh, I would say, house, 
you can see how the grammar is uh, defined. So basically, formulas are divided into two layers. We have this basic layer, which is classical propositional logic, and uh, then we have this probability layer. What was our idea? Where, well, our idea was to construct a bigger house. So uh, basically, we wondered uh, what will happen if this alpha is not just classical propositional form, or what if it's something more complicated? And uh, what if instead of alpha, I have a statement M has type sigma, or even something more complicated than that? So uh, we started constructing our system. How we started it? Well, first, we, uh, we were looking at simply type combinatory logic. So this is our base level now. Then we, uh, we take the set of these uh, statements, M has type sigma. I will say something more about them uh, a bit later. We close that set under uh, classical propositional connectives. And we have now this, uh, this part here. So basically, what classical propositional logic is in LPP2, here uh, it is a set of these statements closed under classical propositional connectives. And then the idea is to um, you know, define probability operator on those formulas, and then again close that under negation and conjunction. So as you can see, the system becomes more complicated than the one on the left-hand side. And, uh, okay, I will be here. So th this idea was presented is in these two papers. When we started working on this, uh, we were looking at simple type calculus. We were looking at uh, the calculus with intersection types. But we were trying to do this with some existing models of combinatory logic and lambda calculus, and we were looking uh, the whole system, and then we realized that it's too complicated to look the whole system, and that we need to take one part of that, in particular, I need to take this part without this probability, the part where I only have these statements uh, closed under uh, classical propositional connectives, and first to uh, achieve soundness and completeness of that system and then to build a bigger one. So here I'm first going to present logic of combinatory logic, <coughs> which is basically that part here. Uh, that is the results we already have. And then I will, um, I will say what is an ongoing work. So for now, uh, my house is without the roof, but I hope it will soon be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, so um, logic of combinatory logic, as actually we already saw uh, in building, where, while we were building this house, is classical propositional logic over simply typed logic. So I have, uh, I consider simply typed logic, I have terms, I have types, and I'm interested in uh, statements of the form M has type sigma. But I want to take all the statements, so I don't want that M can be any term uh, and sigma any type. I just want to take statements that um, can be typed in some context. So, uh, and then I take the set of those statements and then I close it under classical propositional connectives. Here it is negation and implication. In the previous slide it was a negation and conjunction, but since I'm in classical logic, it's enough to take negation and implication I can define um, all other connectives using that, or as well, I can take just negation and conjunction and define implication using that. So it's it's fine to just choose these two. I'm not going into details. I will just briefly uh, say uh, how we already saw what is the syntax, and I just want to say how we define uh, how we um, define axiomatization and semantics. So uh, since the system is obtained by defining classical propositional logic over simply typed combinatory logic, the axiomatization is also obtained from the axiomatic system for classical propositional logic and uh, type assignment system for simply typed combinatory logic. In my talk on Monday, there was uh, maybe more details. There was actually a system presented, so the slides will be online, I guess, on Type's website, and uh, you can look at that. And as for the semantics, uh, we define semantics as applicative structure provided with evaluation. And what we, um, what we obtained, well, we obtained uh, that uh, we proved that this axiomatization is sound and complete with respect to uh, 
semantics defined in that way. So this is the result, uh, results we already have and what is now uh, further work, what we now go work on. Well, we now work on this probabilistic extension, so we are building the roof of our house. And uh, so this probabilistic extension I call here PCL. As I said, um, we use probability logic, and this is actually the book where, uh, where uh, you can find overview of some of the probabilistic logics uh, um, introduced by Ognjanovic, Rashkovic, and Markovic, and LPP2 is uh, the simplest one of them. Uh, PCL syntax we actually already saw, so we basically apply probability operator on LCL formula and then close that uh, set uh, we under, uh, again, classical propositional connectives. And uh, as for axiomatization and semantics, so now uh, our system is obtained defining probability logic over LCL logic, so the axiomatization is actually obtained, for, obtained from uh, the axiomatizations of those two systems, and semantics uh, are defined um, using possible world approach, so uh, semantics will be actually some cryptic uh, like structure, and there will be some connection between semantics of PCL, there is some connection between semantics of PCL and semantics of LCL that I uh, I talked before. So what are the goals? Now the goals are to prove that uh, axiomatization of PCL is sound and complete with respect to the semantics of PCL. And uh, we, we believe that, the, I mean, we know that the key part here will be actually soundness and completeness of LCL. That is why we did that part first. Okay, so that was... Uh, the, the second part, and actually, yeah, it, the first half is, <laughs> I spend more time speaking about the first two topics, so the next two will be um, briefly introduced. So the next topic, uh, the, next work, the next work I'm also involved in is about resource control. So uh, when we talk about uh, control of variable use, we can uh, control it by restriction or by extension. And in this work, we control it by extension, introducing operators of duplication and erasure. And uh, we work also with implicit names. You will see that in the calculus, I'm going to briefly present um, we introduce indices that are inspired actually by uh, the Brown indices. So uh, the language that we um, use for uh, resource control is uh, defined by starting with set of R indices where R index is a pair consisting of natural number and a string of booleans. So this natural number is actually just as uh, natural number in the Brown index. And uh, this uh, string alpha actually will give us some information about is uh, the index duplicating at how many times. So we can track the duplication of, uh, of the index. Then uh, besides this index, we have uh, abstraction application as usual. And now we have these two new operators, operator uh, erasure and duplication. Erasure will introduce a variable when it is not there and, for example, we want to abstract it. And uh, duplication uh, will deal with variables that have uh, multiple occurrences in a term. Uh, what was our idea? Our idea was to introduce L types, we call them L types, and they actually are defined as lists of R indices. And uh, the typing system is defined in the way that uh, if I can type some term T with type L, then in L actually will be um, free, uh, free variables or indices of T. And uh, another important property of that typing system is that we define it in a way that uh, if I have a closed term T, which can be typed with these L types, then uh, this, uh, the type of T will be empty list, it's, it's closed, but more uh, important, T will be linear. So 
uh, in that type system that it's not presented here, but I don't have time for that, but can be found in this oh, paper on archive. Uh, the system in, is defined so that uh, I can, um, actually when I type lambda abstraction, I can type it only if there is exactly one occurrence of zero. So um, once I uh, achieve to uh, type a closed term, it means that every variable occur, uh, occurs exactly once in the term. So the term in that sense is linear. So that is actually the idea of these L types and it is still an ongoing work. Uh, and a last part I will just briefly mention is a work in the field of data privacy and in particular about data privacy in blockchain. Uh, this is actually uh, a work within uh, a project that is uh, supported by Science Fund of Republic Serbia. And the idea of project, uh, you can see the title here, I want, of the project in the red, I won't read it, but the idea is to use methods of artificial intelligence and to apply them to blockchain technology, but also to see how blockchain technology can contribute to artificial intelligence. Uh, two institutions are involved in this project, Mathematical Institute of uh, Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts and Faculty of Technical Sciences. And um, the team uh, from Faculty of Technical Sciences uh, consists of, in the team there are Silvia Gilezan, Tamara Stefanovic and myself. So the work I, uh, I, I want to mention today is actually the work with, uh, with Silvia and Tamara. So when we started uh, our, uh, our research uh, within this project, we started uh, studying different methods for privacy preservation. We, uh, we started from some initial methods like K-anonymity, L-diversity, and T-closeness. I'm not going into any details. I can be, uh, say, for example, that if you have some database, you will say that it uh, satisfies K-anonymity principle if you are not able to distinguish one uh, individual from K minus one others. So for example, I know that my friend is in that database, but I cannot tell which, um, which data belongs to my friend. I just uh, can say my friend is one of these K people, but I don't know which one. And so similar. Uh, then in L diversity, it's about diversity of sensitive data, and they have to satisfy some conditions and so on. The later we investigated some advanced um, models for privacy preservation, like differential privacy, contextual integrity, and inverse privacy. For example, uh, differential privacy is a mathematical model which actually uses probability uh, to, to achieve uh, protection of privacy of individuals in some um, database. So this was the first part, and then what uh, we are actually interested in is uh, investigating privacy protection of blockchain. When we are in blockchain, we can look at two different kinds of privacy. We have identity privacy, if we want to protect data of users in blockchain, and we have transaction privacy, if we want to protect um, data about transactions that are uh, that are that happening in the blockchain, and depending on which privacy we are uh, we want to achieve, we have different mechanisms. So at that point, uh, at that at this point, this actually uh, probably looks like uh, way out of topic. So uh, right now, it has nothing to do with any types or anything, but it does not it's not necessarily will stay like that because uh, so we are investigating privacy protection of blockchain, but what we are aware of is that there is some work uh, on using session types to uh, formalize some parts of protocols for blockchain because in blockchain it's all about communication and uh, apparently they recognize that session types can be useful to uh, formalize not all protocols, but some part of protocols are formalized um, in uh, using session types. So there are those attempts, and 
our plan is maybe in the future to try to see if more of that can be done using this. So not only formalizing uh, protocols of blockchain, but maybe formalizing also some notions of privacy in blockchain using session types or something which is familiar. So at the moment, it is not <laughs> in the topic, but maybe in some future time it will be. So that's why I decided to put, to put uh, that part also. And yeah, that is for me. Thank you. Okay. And how you, um, yeah, this will be on the first slide. The feedback which you gave it was actually that, like, in addition of uh, terms, but it was like a reading version of the linear analogy. So, um, uh, sorry, I don't, uh, in this slide here or? Ah, okay, the probabilistic lambda calculus. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so what is the idea here either is that, um, so with this operator, you can construct a term M plus N, which will reduce to M with one half, with probability one half, and to N with probability one half. So you have um, a probability on computation. That's why we, uh, when we define uh, operational semantics, we do not say uh, term reduces to a value, but to a distribution of possible outcome, because one term can reduce to two or more terms, two or more values. Yeah, I was thinking about that during your talk. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Concerning the probabilistic logic and the probabilistic Python system, so there is a sort of semi translation replacing the probabilistic testing operator by having actually quantitative lambda of the logic, right? Because they introduce sort of non continuity. Mm -hmm. They ask, oh, is this uh, basically the probability of something which is old? And then it becomes a true probability, it's going to calculate. Mm -hmm. But this is, uh, as I said, when people have found it more robust to work with uh, whatever formalism you like, fuzzy logic or whatnot, or in the end you get essentially the quantity tells you. Have you thought about doing something like that here? Have you have systems that basically tell you the probability of things, not just testing for probability or something like this, but how to actually? Yeah, we we don't have anything on that, but yeah, okay, maybe. <laughs> Thank you for suggestion. Uh, yeah, because uh, in this system, I do not allow mixing basic formulas with probabilistic one. So uh, once I apply, okay, I will stay here because it's not my system, but it's very similar. So I have, for example, this uh, classical propositional formulas, and then this probability operator can be applied only on probabilistic uh, cl uh, classical propositional formula. So in that I said LPP2 logic is the simplest one because, for example, it does not allow nested probability operators. But they have also more complicated logic where you can apply probability on probability. So for that reason, I, I close it twice because I have a basic level. And then once I go to the probability, I do not mix those, those formulas. Yeah. Thank you.